We cannot tolerate this any longer. Time is not on our side. It's now or never will it ever be done again. Strike the iron pile is still hot. We cannot tolerate this any more. No, no, no. Uh, to those who just uh, joined us and we are live on our Facebook page, Creating the Africa That We Want. And the question still, is African education system still effective today? Um, it's just one of those uh, things we've been talking about and debating uh, this month, talking about the African education system, uh, looking at the labor market right now. It seems like there are so many graduates who do not have jobs. And those who just... Uh, uh, graduated from their high school uh, metric or level A level uh, and don't know what to do. Uh, we are joined in by uh, two of my favorite young people, uh, Teacher Onamashiri and Felix Mbewe, who are doing really great, amazing uh, in Southern Africa, which is South Africa, Zambia, um, and uh, Zimbabwe. They're really doing really, really, really great. And they are educated. Well, they are really educated. Uh, but they also uh, did some uh, uh, skills development projects and they're running their own businesses. They're impacting lives uh, and doing all, all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, we're going to be um, having this discussion and see how it goes. Uh, a very good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Martha, and uh, good afternoon, Tichana. Yeah. Yes, good yeah. afternoon, Martha, and good afternoon, Felix. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm glad Thank to you. on this afternoon. Yeah, I'm doing very well. You guys are looking good. The last time that I saw you, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you're looking better. <laughs> 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 you look, you're looking better than than the last time that I saw you, which means life is really uh, uh, treating you good. Uh, these days, we really have to check everything. We can ask how you're doing, and you can really answer. I'm doing very well, but we re we really need to check everything else um, to see yeah, yeah. if you are really hundred percent uh, doing great. Uh, we're gonna have uh, this discussion with um, Felix Mkomela Mbewe. Mbewe, that's that's a seed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that I got that right. Who is a principal managing partner at Mukomela Consultancy, a passionate and dedicated Zambian graduate uh, from the University of Zambia uh, who holds a bachelor's degree in development studies, uh, philosophy and applied ethics with a specialization in rural and agriculture development. Um, just uh, go and search for him on uh, on Facebook, uh, Felix Mbewe, and then you you will see the amazing work that he's doing uh, on his uh, Facebook. He's really um, one of the people that I follow and just know and know that uh, Africa is in good hands if we've got such young people who are doing uh, amazing things. And then we have got uh, Tichao Namashiri, who is a founder and effective and efficient uh, business analyst, ICT consultant, and a Cisco specialist capable of providing a professional satisfactory and speedy services are through innovation and strategic ideas in the ICT and commerce related uh, industry. Uh, in uh, I've worked with uh, Teach, uh, I've actually worked with uh, both gentlemen and have uh, uh, worked with Teach the longest. I think we met at Organization of African Youth and yeah, we were mm. really one of the <laughs> one of those comrades and we have also worked together to um uh in it to empower young people um uh we offer mm -hmm. uh, free it free it uh courses uh in africa as well uh, which are cisco certified uh, i've also worked with felix uh we met in this uh, pan pan african movements i think uh, which is which is always uh lovely uh, to those who just tuned in the question today is african education system still effective and i don't know who wants to go first introduce yourself i i think i've done some justice but you can give us a uh, a mini bio then answer the question is Afri african education system still effective today oh. 
I, I thought Mr. Felix introduced himself first, so he was going to also go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, I can start first, Chawana, um, uh, as I introduced by Martha. Uh, my name is uh, Mbeo Felix Mkomela, and I'm um, Zambian. I'm, I'm a managing partner at Mkomela Consultants, and I'm also a farmer. Uh, that's the easiest definition. And uh, in terms of education, since we're discussing education now, I'm um, a graduate from the University of Zambia, and also I'm still pursuing my postgraduate studies. Will be finishing in a few months. Uh, thank you so much, Mother, for this platform, and thank you so much, uh, my fellow panelist Tachiaona. So, answering in brief the question, if uh, education is still working or it's producing any results in Africa, I, for one, I believe, uh, for the sake of opening up our minds, it does. It is working in that sense. Though I will be quick to mention that the most of it, largely the education system that we acquired is from the colonial masters, which ideally was meant to make us work, okay, for our colonizers, which worked effectively very well. If you look at most of our use statistics for Zambia, eh, the majority of the people we have, they work for the civil service and the government. But if you look at the output in terms of profitability, it's even less than 5% compared to a few people who are working for themselves and those that are working in the private sector. Now, this should tell you that the biggest employer, for example, which is the government, is struggling even how to pay the people. Why? Because there's very little that comes out in terms of uh, profit, because what they do is not income generating. So right. with that background, I'll be quick to mention that the neo-colonialism mindset has perpetuated up to today with very little that has changed. Our focus, for example, you guys who are in tech, you do realize that uh, there's very little investment in the technology and science. If at all we have the technology in Africa, it's obsolete or it's copycat. People are meant to duplicate ideas or how to operate machines and or not to innovate. There are very few innovations that you can show me that are very successful and you can point at and say, this is a Zimbabwean innovation and this is what it is doing for Zimbabwe or for Zambia. Local indigenous technology, it's not uh, cherished or it's not there. So I, for one, I feel most of our education is based in the arts where people memorize and read things. That's and right. They go and sit in offices day in, day out, just, you know, <laughs> doing the same thing which has very little value the same That's stuff right. they read at school is what they will come up and show you at work but show us the substance of what your education was able to do for you or what you're doing for your communities you'd find it's nothing so my argument is based on that uh, analysis i feel you if we can do an overhaul or a restructuring of our education, probably come up with our own or the hybrid of both the pre-colonial, colonial and the current uh, status quo that we have, we should be able to have a better system in education, which is hugely going to impact on our development as a continent, sure. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that's that's really uh, well put. Our education system is still uh, from the colonial era, uh, preparing us to be uh, employees and <laughs> not employers. Uh, and the job market is not matching up with that. And the government, as you said, is the biggest employer in most African uh, uh, countries, which is uh, quite sad. Uh, the um, uh, private sector is not really catching up uh, to that extent and we would also want to answer uh, that why the private sector is not able uh, to to provide for all of those graduates and 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 the skills learned uh, over to you teach thank you uh, martha and thank you felix 
for the input that you have brought uh, up so far and um, uh, Martha to organize, uh, to make an arrangement for us to sit and discuss this uh, or to at least share our opinions, our perspectives and our experiences in that regard. And just like what Martha have also alluded, um, yeah, I'm teacher on a machine, I'm known as teach. Uh, to make it easy, I'm based in South Africa and the Eastern Cape Province. Also graduated from in, um, uh, Investor Forte in Bachelor of Commerce Information Systems. I've been pursuing postgraduate studies in the Masters in of Sciences in Information and Management Sciences. I've not done justice to finish it off. Yeah. <laughs> because of entrepreneurship, but hopefully this year I will try to push my studies. And uh, it's one of the things that actually is I am pursuing these things. Uh, you know, from our times, even when we've met with Martha and other platforms like Chef, alluded that, uh, you know, we, we had ample time to interact, uh, interrogate things that um, affect and uh, that affect particularly youth and that we experience as we grow up. Uh, and one of the things that becomes paramount and important and imminent it's our career choices and uh, get to know uh, this thing that I'm pursuing or a means of earning a living. Is it the best? Is it what I could have done? Is it what I should continue to do? Is there something that I should change? I, I, I grew up at a young age asking questions. Uh, in, number one, either being the status quo, but number two, why are we not having perhaps things that we wish or that should to a normal human being should be okay. For example, one of the things that should be normal to any person who has finished high school, perhaps was to have a privilege to go to what we call uh, postgraduate studies. Either you go to a polytechnic or you go to a university. And remember we, how, how many of us as young people, as uh, young as African youth, being told that education is, is an answer to our problems. That's right. And now if we finish school and then you you will find that you are sitting with more, more bigger problems than, than the one that you were having before you graduated or before you because you get you, you get a qualification, then you struggle to get job. No, you get job, perhaps you don't get paid well, or you realize that I, I think I should have studied that and that and that again. Just to give another simple, typical example, one of my closest friends that I, I, I'd been working closely and to, uh, with here in the Eastern Cape, he, I left South Africa. He's, he's a Burundian by origin, uh, by birth, but he grew up in South Africa, did his master's in Nelson Mandela University. He was lecturing at Uso for a number of years before he get another post there, before, and I knew that I know that he was trying to finish his PhD. I think the one that he was doing in, and he left South Africa. He's now in based in United States. And one yeah. of the things that he was telling me that you don't need a master's degree to be a director in the United States. That's right. Or perhaps a perhaps a master's. He said, "What is hundred percent sure? You don't need a PhD." <laughs> yeah. But yet, yeah. yet Africa. If you finish your master's, they tell you no. If you can have your PhD, you're going to get so opportunities. And That's people, right. will still finish, people will still finish PhDs and they'll start to tell you other challenges of having these PhDs and now I have a lot of professors as well. So the, 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 we need right. to be honest and ask ourselves honest and diligent questions. <laughs> that is, is this, these things, are, are they really so doing what they intended to solve if not, why are they not? And if That's not, right. what should we do differently to make sure that these things they solve their problems? I, I, I read quite a number of local. I've, I, I, I befriend so many. Most of the people that I'm in business, my, my full time job now since 2019, I run an IT company. We also do skill, the skills development. We train, uh, like what Martha said. Like in South Africa, currently, we are even running a leadership. For the local based MICT CETA courses, they call them 
but we also still do skills programs to train internationally accredited uh, recognized qualifications but those things they've also been making some somewhat impacts in the sense that with those uh you know global private companies they they are not they are quick to because they relate with them they come from them so so i i think my comment when it comes to education we we always need the education mm -hmm. and one of the things that i know especially if you tell uh, somebody that you know to go to school is not a one size fit all answer to your life, to your problems if you want to to take that approach particularly if you've not gone through the education system yourself you also become That's disqualified right. to comment on that but That's true. I, I, I resonate with what Felix has said, and I remember when we start to talk things like this, I strongly feel that Africa needs to take what they call the issue of decolonization of curriculum into consideration. Right. And I think uh, I may not be the best subject person, but I've not been doing enough justice to actually research, but it's something that is always at the back of my mind, immediate back of my mind, that we need education that that speaks to African context, to African people, to African communities, setups. So that with this kind of education, we are not only relying on global, we are not only be, because the challenge when it comes to one of the things that normally being spoken of, especially as in digital ambassador or somebody who is in the IT space, uh, mentoring or grooming other young people or, people of my age, even old people, because sometimes we are asked to do that through projects, through work. But uh, frankly speaking, we, 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 we need to take this thing seriously as Africans, that whatever that we're going to regard this knowledge and whatever that we're going to pursue is inf information that is necessary, we, we need to, to have serious input to it. And it needs to be contextualized well so that it can indeed uh, address some of the challenges that we are facing as African people. Yeah, uh, I've been, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tish, uh, for that and um, uh, everything that you have you have shared and how you are pushing uh, to change from just the focus on getting PhDs and stuff. And you are right about that. Um, looking at the uh, us looking at uk and all that the phd um i think as africans we are really <laughs> being a bit dramatic uh in terms of how far uh we we want to go uh, the skills skills is just what they consider plumbing a plumber is is earning a whole lot of money uh compared mm -hmm. to uh you know a phd holder in hr in africa so we can just pick any 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 uh, subject that we wanna pursue or any specialization, adversity, and you just think, nah, this is the way to go. This is what I wanna do. But uh, you really need to do your research in terms of the job market. Uh, I was having a discussion with somebody that if I was exposed um, to certain people, uh, certain platforms as far as 2005, 2010, I could have chosen my career much better and way too early and just started uh, specializing in something else something that i can do with my own hands even if it was carpentry i would have just chosen to go with that uh, because our curriculum and our education system is not able uh, uh, to cater for the market right now we spoke about the private sector it's because what the private sector is demanding right now a business analyst uh, is demanding software developers do we have that an average uh, uh, person who was born in the 80s and, and, and 90s right now is catching up where IT is concerned. We're just catching mm -hmm. up. I can give you a very good example. At the high school that I went to, we didn't have computers. We never learned computers. Till today, they don't have one computer. And if you, we don't go back and say, let us have computers, the next 10 years is just going to still be the same. And when it comes to rural Africa, um, mm. that's just how it is. So I've got I've got a question for you, uh, for you both here. When did you uh, make the switch from the focus being, um, you know, 
ed, ed, the normal education, the clever black <laughs> education, uh, to uh, putting your focus on skills to 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 say, uh, you know what, agriculture, farming, this is the way to go. This is what is selling. What what inspired you? Who inspired you? Uh, teach. Uh, when did you make the switch? I mean, uh, when you were in Zim, of course, you, you were one of the clever blacks who really wanted, <laughs> just when I study, when I'm done with this, I'm going to go to this level. When did you make the switch? Was it because of migration? Was it because of certain people? Uh, because I'm asking this question because we are all within the same age groups, the 80s, the 90s, right? And we have those smart blacks who are moving away from the clever blacks and you know adjusting themselves how are you doing that how, who is speaking to you why can't everybody else uh, do that you can you can start anybody who wants yeah to mine is very interesting mine is very interesting on that one i don't know if if, if Alex wants to go first but i'll just share an interesting story on that no, please go ahead. Please, go ahead. Mine, I, I, I think mine was actually extremely good ordained because I, I don't know how I ended up to do things that I do now and, you know, having passion for them and actually finding out is, is a calling in a way because as I was in Zim, in my high school, I actually did commercial subjects where I was doing accounting for the first time and I liked accounting and actually because... And one of the things that made me to end up doing commercial subjects in high school was, and it's not like that was really, really my passion at the beginning. Let me say, things that, the word career guidance was not, it was not existing to me. Because my first prime seven years, in fact, nine years, I was studying in rural areas. In rural in, 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 in Daramon, Bichifu, Martha, if you can know. But you, you know, yeah. Bichifu town, when you're passing to Harare, you travel 60 kilometers to go down in rural areas. That's where that's where I did my first nine years of schooling. I've never that way the career guidance was not existing there. So you just go to school. Your first your first target is you start to mature grade six seven is that you get a good grade for grade seven because when I writing national exams, you get good grades there. I get eight points so that you could you can have a potential to go to a very good high uh, secondary school. So my first second two years of secondary life while I was still in rural areas. I ended up migrating to Harare because my, my dad was owning a house then and my parents could not afford to take me to any boarding school. But I was that one of the, uh, you know, open-minded or open heart child who wanted good learning. Because like I said, those are things that will be taught. If, if you ask your question, why are we in poverty? Why do we live the way we live? Why are we not like this other family? They always say school should solve your problems. <laughs> and that is the answer that we always hear. So I, I, I influenced them to take me to a good school when they could not afford to take me to a to a to a boarding school. But even when I went to Harare, which was capital city, I was still staying in location in Focus. I was still going to a, a location-based school. I think I saw computers for the first time in that school. There were two, about two, three donated computers in a school lab, library, so not lab, with no internet. That's but right. you know, what, what has made me change my career, to answer in short, I was just wanted to give a, a context and background enough. So right. as I went to this high school, I ended up doing commercial subjects because I could not get exposed enough to science on time. But I remember growing up, I wanted to be a doctor, or I needed science to stuff. Uh, uh, but because of changing schools, not going to those kind of these schools, I end up settling for and this accounting, science, this commercials. It was also coming into you know, especially in a black child, and that's when I had get to know about it. after due to my own research, after or not 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 uh, career guidance, mentoring stuff. Because I remember I started to read, and that's when Zimbabwe economy was also going upside down. I, right. I was get to know as a high school. As a high school learner doing economics, geography, and accounting at high school, I remember I was going to collect uh, each, each time I had an opportunity to go to, to CBD. I would go home with the bullet, mantel police statement bulletin from Dr. Gideon Gono, trying to, <laughs> trying to understand the stuff. 
So I became passionate. I'm telling you the truth, honest truth. And I, 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 I end up now with the passion. I'm going to be a chartered accountant. I can't be an economist. I'm going to be a chartered accountant. And there were very few of them. Yeah, hey, chartered accountant, they make a lot of money. <laughs> so I was, I, I grew up with that thing that I'm going to also make that lot of money at some point. I, whatever it takes, I should do that. Fast That's forward, right. my little brother, who at that time, I knew he went for, a, for, 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 a, for an electricity utility company in South Africa called ESCOM. That's where he was working, but just after, I, before I came to South Africa, he had also designed to start his own IT company. So when I came, uh, he's the one who had financed me to come to South Africa. He was going to be my guardian and my sponsor for my tertiary education. And when I went first time, I went to write placement case, investor for the past. And when I went to register to study this become accounting stuff, because I remember with my high school learners, some of them already were on the university. And we were That's like, right. we're going to make this accounting thing. It's going to work. So after I register, you know, when you, when you go to, to university, you, you do that initial registration. They tell you your subjects and, and, and. So I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated, young man who is also learning new things. Uh, Martha can commensurate the difference between a life in South Africa and life in Zimbabwe. Coming from yeah. that background, now I'm in East London. I'm going to go and study at the University of Fort Mkabe in some of these prestigious people have studied. So I knew that I was going to make it. But now his response when I get home, it was the shock of my life. Because I went home, be happy that I've registered to become accounting. Uh, I'm going to actually be judged an accounting. I did say that I'm going to be But, you know, I said confidently with love. And uh, this duty is now just accountants. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's my love. My own brother is saying this. It's okay mm. that you're going <laughs> to... But if we're going to start finances, yes. Finances are the real guys. If I finance... He was looking at the context of a CFO. I remember that time he was pursuing MPL. That's from right. graduate, from engineering graduate, he was running his own business. And I know, if I'm not mistaken, he was studying MPL. So me to go with a passion that I'm going to be a an accountant, he saw as if I'm not, I'm not dreaming enough. He didn't tell me that. But, and he didn't say I must change anything. But just to say, yeah, it's okay. You know, to a, to a young man with walked seven kilometers to go all these wicked crooks. I'm at university and that was his response. Inside, I felt a cold. I, I, did not, I was not happy with that. I didn't ask him why, but I'm like, is this guy trying to be jealous of me now? What's happening? You know, but I, I always thank God for his remarks. So he's, he was telling me what he thinks, what he feels. He didn't, we didn't talk about it that time, but I knew that at some point I was going to ask, I think. And from that also, that first year, uh, I remember I carried one of the modules uh, as a, I wrote sub uh, uh, for both in accounting module and passed that sub. And if I want to be saying, I end up killing one course, I want to be saying, no, we're going to second year in accounting. But that's also why, why, why I said, but no, this thing is not even moving fast. And after all this accounting, and after all this guy said, uh, so we, we, me and my friends, we told, uh, let's change, let's change. Because one of my closest friends is, is now a regional manager. He's there in Gauteng. In, he's a software developer working for a global company called Expeditors. So we ended up, you know, friendship, saying, no, let's change from this accounting thing. He's, you know, he, he, my friend's elder sister was a, a, in accounting, so she was almost at the age of becoming a chartered accountant. So we're already also knowing the who can cooks for you to become a CA. But also that hey, this thing should be somehow also being overrated. That's us, us analyzing it. So we decided to go into IT. So we changed, right. become from, I changed from become accounting to become information systems when I was going my second year. It, uh, uh, but also now, remember, I, would, I wouldn't have taken all the courses that I was supposed to have taken in the first year. It was, I was enrolled for a different course. So it also made me to stay even longer in the university. But I never, if there's one thing that I've never, never really regretted was that change. Because in IT, it's a skill that I can 
for your own information, it's like the third year investor was already now able to design some few stuff, learning coral draw, I could design letters, I could design, so uh, what you call this, um, business cards. I remember I was made a computer lab technician, voluntary one. I was now good, and I, I, I loved machines. I loved playing with technology. People would also come home if they want for me to operate, to, to install operating system from them. So it opened another dimension, another sphere, another space for me. And, but I cannot say it was my own doing or my own intelligence. God orchestrated me to change. And That's even right. after today, uh, I, I know that IT is not everything, but I normally want people to have a real skill, proper skill, something that, that you can do outside the classroom environment. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's what is more important because those are things that will help you in and outside the work environment. Wow. Thank and you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one last part before I left. I also, now, my late brother passed on when I was my second year, third year. So I did not finish a university with somebody paying for my fees. I had to fend for myself. So it actually it was, I think it was God also helping me to start doing IT because at least I could still go to school, but make some few runs where I could. And yeah. one of the things, one of the risks that I realized I was facing, the ability for me to pay my fees. So I realized that I would, I was going to need about 50,000 runs minimum to pay for my university debt. When I graduated with this information systems, so I asked myself, how is that going to be practical? Now I, I'm still, I struggled even to pay for my rent. I struggled to do this. My parents cannot afford this. To have another young brother of mine who is now being looked after or trying to look after himself, he, he ended up being an accountant, one bit behind me. So I started to do Cisco when I was two at university. Because what I realized after you know people talking and 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 hearing in the university, I realized that with Cisco, it's a it's a it's a networking telecommunication engineering course. But with it, if I can get an industry certificate. Very challenging, very expensive to have it, but I will have my certificate immediately. I can still get a job in the IT industry. So that's why I started that's to right. do, whilst I was finishing my degree, I was doing my industry certifications. I became a different IT learner. And by the own information, I think in my own class, my stream, the one that we graduated information system in my time, I'm the only one in the telecom sector. The other people, guys, most of them are either analysts or software development. I did telecommunications route. Why? Why? Because I was trying to manage the risk of not having the ability to pay for my fees. I wanted something that would work now. It, it take me to the industry now. I must have the skill now. I must have money now. You know, I, I was being pushed to have that, and it really opened. It, it had opened quite a number of doors for me, and I think for now I can stop. That's how I've been navigating careers up to this point. Wow, which is which is really a uh, 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 a beautiful story. It's it's amazing, uh, you know, the events that led to everything. And I love the uh, um, the fact that you were now able to get up for yourself and educate yourself uh, through you know the skills that you learned in IT. And I've been telling so many young people who are in high school right now that if you start learning cybersecurity when you are in grade ten and mm. dedicate yourself to it uh, for the next one to two years. By the time you finish high school, you actually have got mm. this skill and you can fund your mm -hmm. own university. You can also take True. a gap year and, and, and learn uh, internet of things, for example. For and you. after, uh, yeah, you can, you can learn that. Within one mm. year, you know, you know what you're doing, you are certified, you can be able to do mm. that. Uh, over to you, Felix, uh, how did you make the switch? I know Felix was... <laughs> He was making money in IT. He's actually a very, yeah. very good <laughs> software developer. And when when he told me, he's like, do you know that I, I was in IT and I was really making money? Like, mm -hmm. Then what happened? Why are you now a, a number one farmer in Southern Africa and talking about carrots and everything else? Why are you not behind the counter uh, with your keyboard and, and you, you know, looking good and making your money? Why are you not doing that? Mm. Why are you not uh, using those skills in IT to migrate, go to uh, the USA or uh, you know Canada and all that? They they are making, they are paying good money. So why are you 
stuck <laughs> in the farms. Well, what, so, what um, I, I like what uh, Dash has, uh, is from saying and talking about. And if you've seen in my introduction, I've tried by all means to avoid uh, the computer part of me focused. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> or the arts and no. So I'll, I'll let me give a, a good background that to the viewers, listeners, and to, to to us here on this platform. Um, I for one, I grew up with a very religious Catholic family. Okay, so when I was growing up, being devoted to church in my mind, all I wanted to do was to become a Catholic priest. Okay, so. I started finding out a number of things that uh, the priests would talk about and tell me, okay, there are different congregations and uh, setups of uh, different priests that are there. So there was one particular congregation, which is the Jesuit, you know, the Society yeah. of Jesus, which in the Catholic Church was and is still the most educated priest. So that was like the big thing for me, you know. So as I was growing up, I think in the eighth grade, grade nine, I met friends at school who were of a different religious belief. Mostly right. those were from the Adventist, you know, Seventh day Adventist guys, with a different mm -hmm. message against Catholics. So, being open minded, that changed my journey for priesthood. As I was going to a high school, grade 10 up to 12, I was uh, kind of in the middle of um, either going for priesthood or going to, to a secular school and then study something else. But the controversy was about what to study. Because all along I was looking at uh, priesthood and philosophy and all that, you see? So uh, when I finished school, I had the opportunity to go to two public universities in Zambia under the bursary scheme. So I went to, there's a school called the Copa university to go and uh, study uh, sciences there my 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 options were to do computers like computer science but you know in zambia the system then was for one year you only have two schools those doing arts before your major and your quarters you do kind of uh, like a levels and all because we don't have uh, uh the, the different system that you guys have there then i was also supposed to uh, do a pay part of the payment uh, you know for me to register but the buzzer was 75 percent so as i Are we still are we still with him or did we just lose him a little bit? Did Africa happen? <laughs> Africa happened. <laughs> yeah, you'll be back very soon. Yeah, if you just uh, joined us, uh, we are discussing the education system uh, in Africa, if it is still effective and what can be done um, on our part to improve that and to change uh, the narrative. Uh, we are joined in by uh, Felix Mbewe in, in Zambia and uh, Tichao Namashiri, who is based in South Africa. And uh, they are sharing their stories on how they switched uh, from you know, the clever black to the smart black. And <laughs> we want to hear uh, your stories. You can also um, uh, share what you think about the topic uh, on the comment section on Facebook, uh, which is Radio 54 African uh, Panorama Live on Facebook. You can just uh, share and, and, and text what you think. I think Felix <laughs> is back with us. Oh, yes, you can go sorry. ahead. I know Africa happened. So, <laughs> so uh, I was using my phone then to connect. So somebody called. So I switched my laptop. I hope yeah. I won't have any inconveniences again. No, that's so. Can I, I go ahead? Yes, yes, yes. Please continue. Okay. So I was given seventy five percent of my sponsorship from the government. At the same time, like two three months later, my name came out again under the school of arts. Now the University of Zambia. And then I was given 100%. So I had to make a choice. 
where somebody is paying for you for free and where you need to top up some money. So I decided to leave the Copper Belt University and went to the University of Zambia. Now in the School of Arts, there were different programs, economics, law, you know, all different kinds of things. But because I was coming from this background where none of all those things were at the back of my mind, you know. So I was like, what should I go for? Uh, one year we did, which was to, you, you qualify, you make your point so that to go to law school, the school of economics or any other programs. I did qualify, but I never liked any of those courses. So to become a lawyer, I was thinking that is just too limited for me. So an economist like, okay, I'll just sit in some bank somewhere. Then I went on to the Department of Philosophy. I was like, I want to study philosophy. So I was the only person in that school. So this HOD looked at me, you know, so amused and said, um, but we don't have really anybody who has majored in philosophy because where are you going to work? You know? Yeah. And uh, I said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, good one. I, I will take a double major. Let me pick another course from the School of Humanities. So they asked me to apply to the School of Humanities. Among the courses I was doing, because I had development studies, I had sociology, psychology, and all that. So I picked on the Department of Development Studies to be my second major, something that can give me a job, hopefully, when I graduate. That's right. So went on. I was accepted, did my double major now. So as I was studying in my second year, because I come from a family that uh, is so much into farming, okay? And you know the struggles of Africa, you'll be in school and you've got a bunch of young brothers and sisters that are looking up to you, <laughs> you know? So I had to fend for them. So I was paying for my three young brothers' schools. One was in college, two were in high school. The others were like in primary school. So I had to start now thinking outside the box. My dad had left a farm because the time I was going to school, by the way, it's the same year my dad had died. So there was no one really to pay for my fees. That's right. And, you know, being the first born, you know, son, I had to take up that role. So now I started, um, first of all, I would get different crops from um, produce from different farmers who were our neighbors, where our farm was, then find market for them. So I would talk to supermarkets and all, you know? So I would sell that. Then to me, that was making more sense than being in school. But I had to stay in school because I had a buzzer, a sponsorship. That's I went on until my fourth year, the final year. By that time, I had already done an internship with uh, the UN had done internship with American Embassy, you know, I'd all these things, you know, I was so ambitious about this school thing and all. <laughs> then after that, I went on now to start studying. Um, I, I, I was glad when uh, Tash was mentioning about Cisco and all. I decided to go and uh, do a separate program for uh, IDL, you know, under computers and started studying computers. The period in between getting a job and all. Then it was a combination of computers and uh, finance. Did that and, well, it was good, but it didn't really interest me until I got like a proper, proper job with uh, Unilever in, uh, in Zambia, but I was alternating between Zambia, Zimbabwe and uh, South Africa. So went on different departments under Unilever and settled into IT again, you know, a thing that I never liked. So I realized, okay, this was good. And I saw how much people were getting, by the way, those who are into IT compared to everybody else. Because we had like a third party in, uh, <laughs> who used to do the Unilever system and how much we used to pay. He was such a young man, you know, like he used to get a lot of money because it managed our system, our websites, everything. So I, I was like, okay, this is good. I'll settle in in this department, probably grow myself, but I've got the most basic qualification. My qualifications are elsewhere. Then I remember one day having a conversation with my grandpa, because my grandfather is this person who is um, a hands-on person. He can make doors, chairs, he can make almost anything at a farm. So I was like, 
I need a job that I can work outside the office at home or anywhere else and make money for myself. So I was like, uh, yeah, it's good, but you guys are maybe used in your offices and no. Uh, he proposed, can we do something at a farm? Then I was like, okay, because since I was in second year, we used to, we had this think tank, which we had different programs. I, for one, had picked agriculture by default without really thinking about it. Maybe so it was because of the background I had at home. So I was like, okay, I'll try to think of a model that can help farmers to grow crops with zero chemicals and zero fertilizers and see if that can work. So I started pushing for that. So it became more of uh, about impact, social impact for me. Even as I went on working, working under finance and IT with Unilever, I got so tired at some point in 2022 and I was like, I need to stop this whole thing because I was in between my farm, uh, helping other farmers grow their own farms, doing organic and conservation agriculture. Uh, I was like, no, I need, it's too much for me. I can't manage. But how will I survive if I stop when my farm isn't as stable? Uh, should I go back and do my computer science and maybe get stable and just go uh, as an IT guru, you know, then I said, no, that's not my thing. I, I, would, I would rather do something that has both uh, social impact and also it will benefit me as a person. So I said, okay, computers, I'm done. So by the way, Tachi, I, was, uh, I started out as um, a resource, um, business intelligence, moved on to becoming a business analyst and two hours a senior analyst. And uh, that was the most hectic job I've ever done. I would go in the office from seven, your friends knock off, you remain three, four hours managing the system, doing backups, checking out for my way and all that. Uh, I said, no, I can't go on with this life. Because I'm always working every day on my computer. I remember having to go through a serious breakup because I, I didn't have time even for a girl, by the way, you guys. So I was like, no, this so IT issue is not my baby. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I would rather be out there interacting with crops and animals and people than sitting and breaking my head with all these softwares, with all these... Uh, no. I, I was like, no. In IT, these uh, business analysts are, are really well paid, uh, and those who are, are doing a business intelligence, they really make a lot of money. Um, yeah. IT business development in the IT sector. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of uh, recruiting and placing um, business intel people, business analysts, and so forth. And we've been paying like 700 to 1,000 average for senior developers per hour. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's but Africa, when somebody is earning that amount, you know, 750 to 1,000 an hour, that's, that's quite a lot of money. You can really live comfortably. Yeah. And when we then take it to uh, the international platform, they, they're paying real money. I'm talking between 150 to 350 uh, uh, thousand US dollars annually. So when you are making that amount, it's it's quite a lot. So why is uh, kind of that uh, of um, uh, kind of money that you can make or finance not really a a, a motivator for you? Because you were, you know, it's seven to five, you lost a girl and you were not an office person. But just still, why didn't finance or money motivate you to look into like, there's a lot of money to be made here. I can just stick it up, uh, do my Monday to Friday, but as long as I'm making this. But you went on to say social impact. So, yeah. I don't know. I just want to understand that part because um, many people, if I, I had that skill, you know, the, the technical skill skill of it with the money that is being made, I would just be, I would think twice. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought about that big time, but uh, I think social impact and also the long term profits that come with agriculture were more and more beneficial for me. And the impact that I've had, if I tell you in 2013, I had done like 25 farmers under my program. 
by 2015 I had 10,500. As of 2022, I had over 3 million farmers that were benefiting from what I'm doing. That's so right. for me, that was a plus. Then number two, the about your missioning, they're quite interesting when you're just starting, Martha. But you realize later on when you have enough muscle, like for example, I've got my Borans, the Brahmans, and <laughs> different hybrids of Keto. If I sell two or three of those animals, that is nothing. <laughs> but it takes time, okay? That's right. It takes time. Yeah, that's what I'll tell you. It takes time, but you have. I was looking at um, what I can do, others benefit, and as well as also uh, things I can easily pass on to the next generation and generations. I was really thinking about your country, for example, like all these white farmers that are migrating from Zim coming into Zambia. They would come with almost nothing. Start within a year or two, they'll be driving all these anti cruisers that you get at almost a hundred thousand dollars one and you'd wonder why when somebody has been breaking their back going to the office every now and then they, they retire even their retirement packages doesn't even cost the amount of that land cruiser so i was like yeah. no this whole work thing uh, I, I can't do it yeah yeah you 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 see when it comes to them uh when we used to have a lot of uh white people people before the land reform um <laughs> How things were was that you would only meet white people at the supermarket when they are yeah. coming to buy things they can produce. They'd be wearing mm -hmm. these, uh, uh, you know, khaki shorts. That's what I knew, knew them for. <laughs> wearing those khaki shorts and shirts. Yeah, you, you're becoming one. <laughs> you know, once I yeah. see the khaki shorts and shirts and, and you know, just, just looking simple, but uh you know the, the land cruiser is parked outside they go back mm -hmm. to their farm their family actually live in the farm and when we look at us uh, uh young people with our family land back home could be five to ten hectares mm -hmm. we want to run away from that and uh want to move into flats in town that's the life that we dream about so how do we take back our young people to say look now that we have we have really tried we have tried to live in flats we have tried to live in town the life here uh, might look like it's 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 all good but uh, the real life is in the farms to to those who can really master agriculture and push for it you can actually make a living out of it how do we how do we convince them that uh, uh it's actually this uh, social impact and a career in farming and money to be made and it's just not you know a dirty job because people don't want to get dirty you know how we are doing our nails these days so imagine me uh you know you know picking worms with my long nails it's just, it's just can can't work my weave will get dust <laughs> so how do you convince me a person like that to say go back to the farm go back and till the land and you can make a living where do we start well i think it's simple um let me just make a quick comment on that uh martha yeah uh, i was trying to also conclude by saying um in your farming business or journey as you grow right now i've got uh, an 80 person because i'm now into precision agriculture I need somebody who can put up drones to check for me which crops are doing what, how to look at after the, the cattle. They need to track all that, develop uh, trackers for um, my performance, the performance of my animals and my crops. Also need technology uh, for, for irrigation to know which the parts of my farm have uh, what pressure and you know which one needs a lot of water, even when applying fertilizers and all. I need to know. So I'm not ruling out everything in terms of the other professions or IT in this sense, because now it's a big thing. If you want to make more money, you need to invest in technology, then you reduce on the uh, cost that would entail doing a lot of uh, labor work. And also, you remember, if you are a successful farmer, you have the finance guys, the accountants that uh, Tashi was <laughs> talking about, you have everybody, HRs and all in one place. Literally, you become at the top of the food chain and everybody works for you. But for you to start, agriculture is not a simple venture. It's not an easy thing. And it needs uh, not just your commitment, but it needs 
money. So depending on the level that you want to start at, you need to put in so much money. You can imagine like one tractor, it would cost you, the simplest tractor would cost you between 30000 to $50,000. Then here in Zambia or in Zim, which young person can improve that? If you can, can afford uh, that, you see? Meaning, uh, how do you now tell young people to stop whatever they are doing or if they have no jobs to say, go back to your land? For instance, where I live here, we don't have uh, state pro uh, power. We have to improvise solar and all that, okay? And just to set up a proper system at home, it costs ridiculous amounts of money. And we are coming from these backgrounds where Tashi can agree with me. We didn't inherit so much from our parents. At least the white farmers and other people. <laughs> Maybe the only thing your parents left you is just words. You see? Yeah. So now, as in starting on your own with zero money, zero nothing, or maybe just a skill or passion, how do you go and improve yourself on the land? Even if you are to grow a few things here and there, you need transport, you don't have a car, you don't have a motorbike or anything to move your produce from wherever that village or that rural place is to the market. By the time you're getting to the market, most of the things are withering, they're drying and they will not look as good as you might want them to look. So there are all those bottlenecks or challenges that we have in the agricultural sector, okay? But for your own information, in Africa, more than 80% of our population, we are farmers. But the contribution of the total GDP of all the 50 plus countries from, from all these, the biggest chunk of our people that are into farming is even less than 20%. That's nothing so you would now imagine and say but why even focus on farming when there's no profit people they are, they, they are, they are, they are you, you guys know these stories you've got your uncles your cousins that are farms in the villages you in town they're busy calling you they want some money for this money <laughs> yet it should be the other way around it should be them having more money than you in the city okay. but because of these opportunity constraints that are there you'd realize it's not as easy as it may be portrayed. Why? Because capital has been the major problem. So how to sort it out? I, for one, I feel after going through all these stages and being a stable farmer now, I think the best we should do is um, we should have a deliberate policy or a program under, especially government-run programs, that does not only talk. You know, in Africa, there's a lot of lip service, people talk and talk, yeah. politicians talk and talk. <laughs> but if we can deliberately say, those that have uh, interest in agriculture, whether you, whatever level of education you've reached, there's the national service in most countries, go there, they're doing a lot of agriculture, be trained after that, when they see that you can produce and you've got true passion, let them give you not money, but they give you seed, they can give you a simple equipment, a plow, Oxy driven plow, we can give you two animals, go and start. start somewhere. Then you need to improve yourself from there. That is a loan, it's not maybe a gift. Then after we, you are done, maybe first, second season, you start paying back. Then we will revolve, rotate that money back into that program. That is on the government side. Well, if there's no government, like for some of us, there was no any intervention from the government, what do you do? It's on you. We are lucky and very blessed in Africa that we've got family lands, you know, compared to Western countries. Meaning each one, or almost everybody, has some piece of land in their village or somewhere. But usually people, as you said, Martha, especially you ladies, you don't want uh, to start from scratch. You don't want a job where you're spending your days in the sun. You don't want to touch a dirty. You have got your makeup on your face, you've got your lipstick, your nails, and, 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 and trust me, uh, the, the, the time I was working in the office, touch, working with computers, I was so light, but now I'm dark because I spent most of my time in the sun. That's right. So those are things that people don't want to do. But if you can humble yourself and get to know what you want to do, you can start with a zero. Trust me, there are models that I teach up to today the only thing that you need to buy, for example, is something for less than $1, which is just seed for certain high value crops like the spinach, lettuce, 
a passion, uh, broccoli, a cauliflower, all these things that fetch a lot on the market. Just a crate of that, you can go and sell more than the person who did kale or rape or Chinese or cabbage, the, the normal usual vegetables that other people are doing. Just yeah. find something special and so rare that you can do that will make you some money. Then for me, people who used to know me as somebody who used to do cabbages because I just started cabbages because I had not had any proper background in agriculture. Went and started, I would produce, I'm sure Martha, you've seen my biggest cabbages, I'll produce the most quality yeah. cabbage. And everybody, throughout the year, guys, I would have cabbages. No matter what quantities you want, people would be like, go to this guy. Then, then I was doing it in Osaka. Then the farm was like two and a half hectares. After making a bit of money, I decided to leave Lusaka. I went 500 kilometers away into the bush and went to the best market, which was closer to the DRC. Congo has got over 150 million people, and those buy food from Zambia. And for me, I went closer to those guys, got another farm, and started now supplying food to that market, which is Kasumbalesa border post between Lubumbashi and the Copper Belt of Zambia. So when you start it's hard trust me and doing farming remotely for me i was working a uh, touch and mother breaking my head with computers and you know knocking off late when I'm, i call my farm manager when i go to the farm on the weekend i find a mess yeah. uh, people haven't done this they haven't done i decided just on that i was so full i was like no i need to do this myself and when i left my job to go and do that. That's when things started yielding results. So yeah. even the whole education thing we're discussing now, the whole idea of encouraging young people to go into farming, their self-drive is everything. Then yeah, one way or the other, opportunities do show themselves. People will be shown, will be drawn to you that are in line with the passion of the thing that you have and they'll help you. It's not so much about money. Some of us have ridden on the shoulders of others and they've taken us from one stage or the other to the other. Right now, I just launched my sugarcane juice, yeah, which is I the first ever in Zambia. Yeah. Yes, and, and trust me, I'm making sure that I feed each, nature, each and every chain store, each and every sh shop here in Zambia. That should be not so be, yeah. I'm doing, for me, that is the ultimate goal, from the farm to the shelf, period. I'll, yeah, I'll end here for now, guys. Thank you so much. And and really, Felix is doing a lot when it comes to farming. Uh, you you uh, can check him out on YouTube as well, uh, where he teach people step by step how to grow cabbages. What what type of land do you need? Uh, I, I kind of abuse him sometimes. Like, I, I want to grow something. How do I go about it? Which 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 seeds do I need to buy? And he's, he, he share all of these things for free. So I think right now, uh, saying I I don't know where to start. It's just an excuse. Uh, we we also, you know, thank those who are innovative enough, uh, who, who, you know, brought in social media, the internet and everything. We get this information for free. Somebody had to go and study, put in their money, put in their time, and they're giving it to you for free. And you still say, I, I don't know what to do uh, with all of this. People were stuck during COVID in lockdowns stuck in town where we, could, we couldn't pay rent, where we couldn't buy our own food. We had to send messages to say uh, we need food parcels. So imagine if somebody would have packed their bags before uh, the borders or, 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 or uh, the towns were locked and go back to the village and say, I'm just going to be here during this period and I'm just going to be looking after uh, uh, chickens, like what uh, the guy called Terry. Uh, they always call it Kwateri. The guy is doing very well in, in Mondoro in Zimbabwe. He started with the road runners. He's been traveling like around the world talking about how he started. I saw the journey myself on social media. And he, he doesn't have to like do um, uh, quite a lot of editing. He just shade as it is. I've cooked my pup, I've cooked my sada and my road runner. And this is what we're, we're selling. And he's doing amazing amazing work so uh, uh, these things are um are also self-driven that's that's also very very important you 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 can't do it if you are not self-driven a teacher we have uh, we have worked together you know how people can just go mute 
when you are running a project. You know how you can be disappointed. <laughs> you know how you can be promised the funding. Like, no, we're gonna we're gonna fund you guys, and they, they just go quiet. We have done pitches where we needed funding uh, uh, for projects, and people just go be like, oh, nice, this is lovely, this is a great idea. How much do you guys need? Okay, we need 50,000 uh, for starters, then we can do awesome, awesome. Send us all the details. Then they come back tomorrow with an email, would be great to inform you. <laughs> You know, how do you how do today you move was, forward? Was, up to today, we're still waiting for funding a uh, month. But <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> just, just just to summarize, I, I really like uh, what Felix has been sharing. And um I resonate in quite a number of things. And and the, to me, the summaries for what Felix was talking about are two words, extremely two words. Yeah. One is passion. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking, especially with young people, especially Africans, they need they need to discover that they need to pursue or to look within themselves. They need to be taught that or to be mentored. That's right. Because I, what I believe, like for example, myself, uh, up to chasing funding, like we are saying, mother, you won't believe if I tell you that for the past eighteen months, we have made more than more than fifty million revenue of uh, sales and this is uh we are doing eastern cape broadband rollout is our main project our main client right now it's, it's, it's liquid telecommunications south africa yeah. um we've also just finished registering in zambia i should talk to felix thanks to martha yeah, you should. <laughs> we yeah. want to come that side but but you know what 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 you need, need young people needs to be taught to be to be told blatantly it's an issue of passion you must discover your passion That's the reason why i excel in it is because i have passion for it even when, you are, when i'm not being paid i yeah. when it comes to bridging digital divide when it comes to digital transformation i think martha knows my my yeah. in, my intestines can, can speak on my behalf too that's how i like i love these things and that's why what what i've learned throughout the period is that you must discover your passion and they grow it to such an extent that your passion must start to pay you. That's right. So you must not chase man. The problem is chasing man. That's yeah, number one. Right. Number two is the number two, and I know that we've got stomach issues. We always talk about them. They are real. It's also the issue of starting ground up. I did yeah. not start. I did not take. I, I could not get funding alone to start this business. And mother, mother knows. Mom knows that. That's true. But we started with nothing, with everything that we have, or with negative, if it means so. But that's how we believed in these things. That's how we grew. And they want, being that want to, to we're not, we're not going to say you must be willing to pay the price. He, right. he said something that when Zimbabwe, when white farmers left Zimbabwe to go to Zambia, after a certain period, it's not going to just happen that after a certain period they are driving certain cars or they are wearing certain exactly they are willing to put it the the sweat the work and they are not like you put a city today and then tomorrow it must boom yeah, we are used to automatic, especially this this new this new generation they are so uninformed or misinformed yeah. about uh, quick results there's nothing yeah. for the quick results I, uh, yeah. For me to, to pursue business in IT, um, Felix, I to design from a global company. I used to work for Dimension that as a network engineer. Okay. Yeah. But like I said, with the time, you see that even the numbers, when they say you're being paid, I was happy, oh, you can be happy that I get paid 700 rand an hour, month or 1,000. But you know that's yeah. the time when I can be paid 2,000 rand an hour now. That's right. And right now, even if they're calling, I, I'm not the one who normally has to go. I got people that can uh -huh. go for me yeah. or with me. You start sending your own people. So it was the issue of impact that I was looking for. It was the issue exactly. of fulfillment that I was looking yeah. for. And it was the issue of living a legacy, aligned with your, your yeah. purpose as an individual. So people That's need why. to find purpose. People need to find their passion and feed mm -hmm. that passion enough. And if a great and, support system, because... Uh, you know, you know, teach when we, when we met, I was talking a lot about uh, this IT thing. I had no clue. All I knew is that now I come from Berengua, I grew up in Berengua, I was born in Masingo, and I just want to do computers. That's all I knew. 
mm. uh, the broader part of what mm. what uh, computers or IT was about then came in from the people that are mm. aligned to and befriended. Mm -hmm. So you, mm. you, you just have a, a, a group of five people who have no idea where they are going and they are just playing together uh, uh, Friday to <laughs> Sunday. It's all about, uh, you know, going out there and, 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 all, and, and dancing around and, and, and stuff. You are not mm -hmm. sitting and telling yourself that, you know, the friendship that I have right now, don't have a clue mm. where we're going. How do we mm. then align with those people who have walked the road? There were so many things that I didn't know. When we're doing proposals, uh, remember um, the first proposal that we did for HomeLink funding that we're still yeah, waiting for yeah. <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> I came to teach. Uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm mostly on the on the stakeholder management. I just know how mm. to find people. That one is. And she does, she does it very well. She does it <laughs> It happens automatically. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, I find. Oh, it. Nice. <laughs> I knock on doors. I just know you. You can ask me. Uh, do you know uh, this person in this uh, department? I will tell you. Uh, give me a day. I'll find them. I'm. I'm not scared of of knocking those doors. But now, when they wanted this proposal uh, for Home Link and the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, when they wanted this proposal of what we wanted to do, I sat back. I'm like, okay, I just know the general of the vision, the mission, and where we want to go. So how do we put together this proposal? I then called Teach. Teach, this is something that came up. And uh, we need to send a proposal by this date. It's really, really urgent. And uh, we need to have a budget included. Teach was like, OK, give me a few nights. Teach worked on it, send it back to me, go through it. OK, I knew what they wanted. He knew how to put together the proposal and he knew exactly what needed to be implemented. When I read it, I'm like, oh, I actually didn't know we need this. So <laughs> if you are not smart, yeah. if, if you are not smart uh, on a certain subject or on, on something that you want to pursue, align yourself with people who knows it. Find exactly. smart people to... Like when I go there and start talking about things, people are like, nah, how do you know that? I'm like, yeah. Nah, I have a group <laughs> of people that I inbox. Felix knows that, Teach knows that. I inbox you guys for yeah. a reason. When I go to uh, other other media platforms to talk about certain issues in, 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 in Africa, where I don't know, I've researched on the internet, I make sure that I inbox someone. There's parts on Melissa. Patson knows that I'll be inboxing mm -hmm. person. Hi, Patson, how are you doing? This is something that is happening, and um, I, I just don't know how, <laughs> how it works. <laughs> and you'll be like, okay, there's an article that was done in 1945. I'm like, nah, I don't know about that article. Send the link and I start reading. So, the advice to young people is that align, find friends oh. who matters. If you can go mm. on, on social media and watch a celebrity twerking. I can safely tell you, you have got enough data to learn from those people who have walked the road. <coughs> you have enough data to expand yourself. Uh, we do have uh, 15 minutes to go. I love this uh, this uh, conversation, and I want to come back to you guys in terms of um, uh, in terms of funding that we spoke about and how uh, our government can come and chip in. Here's a question for you: Do you think our African government? Uh, the people who are in leadership right now fully understand the challenges that we are going through, fully understand the role they need to play in terms of policy making and implementation. And how can these voices of young people be heard in terms of what needs to be done? I, I, I'm sure that uh, they know right now, uh, Teach, you have worked uh, with, uh, you know, certain individuals who actually knows that you exist. <laughs> Felix, there are certain individuals at Africa Union who actually know that you exist. But why is it they don't pick up people like you who knows these things and say, come, come, you know, come just present, come talk to us. What do young people need to do how do you how do we fit what you are talking about into our policy making and implementation 
I want to answer that in two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> first, the first sentence is that our government, our leaders, African leaders, mm -hmm. those in government, but especially political ones, they have no clue of what an ordinary African. No, seriously. Those guys, that politics is, a, is meant to be a profession now in Africa. Or perhaps in the rest of the world, I don't know. But a poor one in Africa, because in Africa now, when they do corruption, they eat all the money <laughs> and they try to use the change. In, if they do the same thing in Europe and America, I think they use, they do projects and eat the change. Yes, yeah, the other That's way right. around. Yeah, yeah. So to me, I think the best way, I don't know where I will meet across it, not far from now, but it's not my first time to hear about it. Like what the mother was saying that I make sure that me at any given time, I must always be linked, connected, surrounded by great thinkers. I'm, I must not be, I will not sit one and a half hours. Everybody met us in the world, to, 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 be, to, be, to be honest. But most of my time, I, 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 I make sure that I spend it with the right people, the right mindset, right attitude. Like you guys, hence we could spend, sit down and spend <coughs> enough time. But the, the way to, to solve that problem, I think in Africa, they must just pass a law that everyone working in government or everyone at a police level, working at a police level, or even these politicians, their children must go to government school. Their children must go to public <laughs> utilities. If all of them by law are forced to do that, you will see that even this law, all serious problems will be solved. But the problem <laughs> that is long as to have two lives, those guys will continue to indicate left, but turn right. That's right. And these guys, they can continue to just delay like they've been doing, like they always do, appear on a public media, which they own, say what needs to be done, do damage control, come to the next cycle, this next is someone is 10, and, and, and we, we, the youngest African country, democratic country is, is, is in South Africa, which is more than 30 years now. Yeah. But I can tell you that from Egypt, from North to Cairo, from Cape to Cairo, there's no African country that can want to post about real, real development. That's right. Particularly being championed by Africans. And so it means the current things are not working. And you know that most of these people in government, they end up being, you know, I, I was so fascinated. One thing that I wanted to comment, Felix, when you're talking about okay. this, one of my closest friends, one of my closest friends, is he has just relocated now. He graduated in food technology or food science, whatever you want to call it. And he was doing very okay. well. He left, he left more than he left more than three, five employees in Eastern Cape. But then he relocated in New Zealand now. And one of the things that he was telling me, he does quality systems audit. He audit your Coca-Colas, your uh, even I know this company that was making drugs recently for COVID, or one of the South African, what, what, what's, what is his name? I, I'm forgetting. But he, he, he audited, or even Nestle, I know you've audited, they in Zambia, mm -hmm. you should, should link with him so that he can make your juice uh, uh, exportable to, to the export market, because that's what he does. To oh, nice. Quality nice. Systems and, 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 and if you want to export, most of the fishing companies, most of the citrus companies around, they've been working through, the, you know, through them or with them or with the likes of, of, of his company. But I'm simply saying these things are now within Africans. But until Africans can eat their medicine, especially leaders, why, why, why would they change the status quo? So the one answer to that, the one answer to that, their children must go to public schools. Their children must That's go to right. public clinics. And, and if that can happen, these guys will not take time to change the situation of Africa around. Otherwise, we, 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 like what Mother is saying, do you know that I was once at some point, formerly, formerly they've been uh, of Zimbabwe, to come to invite me, that young man, I like what we are talking. It's just an example. But I'm saying, oh, they will hear this, but they, they are not, not going to do anything. And, and frankly speaking, if, if we're only waiting for them, me and Felix, our life would have been thrown in the dustbin. That's but right. I think that's what we need to do to make sure that this situation needs to change. If you can't make it 
change with them, then why why do you think it's gonna change in last place in, in deep rural in Zambia or in Zimbabwe in South Africa? Yeah, that's that's actually true. Do you want to get oh. on to that, uh, Felix? Yes. So uh, you know, uh, guys, what I believe in, I believe in results for me, okay? Yeah. Actions must lead to results. That's right. Mm. So I'll give you a very practical example. Good comparison, Zambia and Zimbabwe. You guys are having a second president since your independence. Zambia is having the seventh president since independence. But look at the changes or development that has taken place, almost zero. Yeah. Now, does that mean politics is solving the problems that Africa has? Not at all. That's true. So I feel in the first place, even the democracy, the type of leadership that we have, the systems, they're all useless, guys. Sorry to say that. <laughs> it's not helping Africa in any way. Yeah. The colonial mindset, the colonial leadership, mode of leadership that we got, it, it does not help Africa in any way. And mm. our African leaders have realized it's a very, very easy source of income for them. And they're using it to make money. You enrich That's yourself easy. because the system is polar. The, the system mm. is open. It's, mm. You can manipulate it. That's I, for true. one, I would say, like, what uh, it, it, it is uh, from proposing, we do the Chinese way. If you go to China today, corruption is uh, almost as the same as uh, the, the biggest uh, capital uh, punishment they can give you. They can kill you. North Korea, mm -hmm. same thing. But in Africa, we love talking and zero actions. <laughs> Especially politicians have taken advantage of that. And as you mentioned, they go in public media and talk and talk about the things they'll brag. But show me the results of what you're saying. Don't just talk. Don't say wow. you built a school. What has that school done in the past whatever years impact in terms of the community? When your yeah. currency is always deteriorating, always losing value, what are you doing? Show us your mm. balance of payment, your exchange rate. How is it doing? Mm -hmm. That and way so you can convince me that is politics is... <laughs> so show me that way that your, your, your politics is solving issues. If, if, if your money has got value, if you have more income, people are stable, people have jobs, people have got a good life. Now, the solution for me, it's not about giving up on politics or politicians. Good right. policies, if you go to your parliament today, teach or Martha, you yeah. see a power and the power of policy documents. Excellent. We're very good at writing these things. <laughs> but show me the implementation or the monitoring of these things. We don't. So I, for one, I think we've got the best policies in the world as Africa. The first solution should mm -hmm. be the tracking of that. We should have a very independent M and D section, which has no interest in governance and all, but to monitor government performance. That's right. Then two, we need young people, people like us here, to be supported, not with money, but platforms, exposure. Okay? And make sure that those people who are standing out, they have the opportunity to lead and to rule. But today, if you check how many people let me use an example for ZANPF, our family members, it's a big number, even here. <laughs> you will be so shocked how many people are friends, patronage, politics is what we're playing up today. So it's about mm. scratch my back, I scratch yours. Mm. Wow. So people have found a source of in income in politics. And it's not about what the person can do. It's about who you are to who. So mm. if imagine I had gone into the public service. I would have been some civil servant somewhere, I don't know, wherever, and waiting for my pension after 25 years. And that's yeah. a sheer waste of talent and skill and passion. <laughs> so yeah. my solution is with this kind of governance that we have, which tends to speak a lot and does very little or less, it should be about individual growth. Remember, poverty in Africa or everywhere has to be dealt at a family level or at an individual level. Mm -hmm. The more we have empowered families, empowered communities, we have empowered nations and empowered community. So if the bottlenecks of poverty are not addressed at an individual level, imagine how many of us uh, 
teach uh, you Martha we should have uh, done this and that to improving our families then collectively we would have been a very wealthy nation or a wealthy continent so we shouldn't just sit back and wait for the government to give up That's but right. begin to push for certain policies when you have capacity like for me now at this level i'm able to speak you see what i post some, sometimes on social media i can yeah. joke about my president here yeah uh, yes because i understand the law and all those things and also i know that i do not need anything or a penny from him i, I can survive on my own you see even today i can tell him that like in his face like i don't need a job i don't need money i don't need anything from you but i need you to change the policies i need you to change abcd for the betterment of the communities that we serve the people I, that I you serve is that accommodative and uh, because i know one one of these countries in africa <laughs> where where i can yes where that's a beauty of zambia by the way you can yeah, you can speak what is on your mind and the government listens yeah because we, we we were talking about uh the uh you know going back to farming and agriculture we had some people in good way recently uh displaced and told that um they no longer own the land it's uh, it doesn't belong to them so sometimes you'd find that uh there are people young and old people in africa who are really pushing to change their situations their communities mm -hmm. but then the governments in africa implement policies that works against their own people so we are always kind of 20 20 years behind everybody else we can give mm -hmm. an example of the u.s the u.s yeah. you don't have to worry about uh, uh, property rights honestly forget about uh, the propaganda mm -hmm. on, on on social media and everywhere yeah. You, like mm. there are rights and amendments that are public that people just know that i am within these rights the government don't mm -hmm. just come and take my property or my land if there is development yeah. that needs to be done on that property they will offer yeah. me this amount if i want they don't just take but coming back to africa where we we say we do have this arable land is the other way around yeah. it's really the other way around people will be really i know a lot of young people who are pushing but right now they are saying if you can get a chance just leave because it's not working you want to push when i yeah. give but there are just a few countries in africa that are still open to hearing young people the rest is actually yeah, like our country is really doing that yeah i saw you writing that and and uh tagging the president i'm like what is he related or something what is it that i don't, <laughs> I don't know i don't do that when i have to kind of talk about certain things that are deep i really write down i think you have seen me writing to be deleted or i would delete because you, yeah. you don't want to get in trouble yeah so, when so, so you see by the way master just on that you know zambia for instance we've had um the most uh, good presidents i know people are willing to make changes but you know what happens they are falling into the trap of a rotten system oh yeah so no matter how good you are the the corruption the dysfunctional structures and all they make you weak and there are people who are pulling you apart you're, you're just one person so yeah. a complete overhaul rebuilding things from zero is what we need we're not so, fighting people we are trying to fight the system it's the system, system. Yeah. Yes, Is it's not right? individuals, it's a system we've created and inherited. That's right. Our Imagine us, we are 60 years this year in October, independence, Zambia. But we are still lagging behind in a number of things and people still talk year in and year out. So, no, for yeah, me, it, it, a complete turnaround is all we need. I, I can see yeah, the progress so. of Botswana, Luanda. A, there are other good examples, uh, Burkina Faso. People have just gone radical. Head on with poverty, forward. head on with the system. Yes. That's right. That's right. 60 years is a very long period of time. A child was born and uh, mm -hmm. the child is 60 now. He gave birth to somebody who is in their 40s, who, who yeah. actually have got their own kids in their 20s and the kid is expecting a kid. That's like four generations <laughs> and there is, there is not much mm -hmm. change. Uh, we have run out of time. And uh, in closing, I just want to um, give you guys an opportunity to share uh, what you are working on, the projects that are available, 
how uh, people can, can reach you, who want to work with you, um, just in two minutes each. Thank you, Mark. You want to go uh, let me start. Um, okay. Yeah, so currently we are trying to, we have not yet given up, like what Felix has said, especially with digital skills transformation. So training is one of our core, core business. We are still trying to push that uh, beyond South Africa now, uh, mostly promoting is in the cyber security, uh, Internet of Things. We are also, we're also eligible to train coding now, uh, Python, uh, so that we can be able to do what we call automated um, uh, in the networks. <clears throat> so, yeah, we are pushing for IRA training a lot. We still do um, digital, what do you call this, telecommunications. We are still pushing, and especially further north, we are looking forward to start uh, find, uh, to continue with infrastructure rollout. I know that South Africa is getting to its maturity stage, but coming to Zamb Zimbabwe, Zambia, and other neighboring countries to build mm -hmm. your fiber and wireless broadband connectivity, that's our specialty. That's what we do for a living. And we, yeah, we are looking forward. As much as I sometimes get so much, uh, in, uh, what do you call it, motivated to, to be persuaded by other guys that I must go to Europe, to America, or to go to them. But for some reasons, I, I still love Africa. <laughs> and I always say, that, oh, guys, I'll, I'll come, I'll pay you a visit. But I still feel <laughs> that I still have a lot of things to do in Africa. I am a Pan-Africanist. I strongly believe in African solutions for African problems. Hence, I, I would want us to, yeah, to push this digital, schools, uh, digital transformation in Africa by implementing our own telecommunications uh, connectivity solutions uh, so that everybody gets plugged in. In other words, uh, everybody. Like right now, <coughs> Felix is attending a very important uh, session, but he's using, he's using cell phone to connect. He's supposed to be using either fiber wireless so that if he's yeah, phone, <laughs> somebody can attend to it, but he's still connected. That's where we should, we should, we should arrive. And that's the Africa that I think we want and we should create. And like what Felix has said, we're not going to only wait for what government is going to do. We can do our part today and try to influence the government so that all of us, we need together a, a gen travel with men, we can travel very far. And thank you for the platform. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Tish. Uh, thank you so much for your input. Uh, Felix, over to you before we wrap up. Okay. Uh, just a quick final words from me. I also believe in uh, African solutions for African challenges. Then I also believe <clears throat> we can do it, let's not give up. I've had also different opportunities to leave Africa, leave Zambia. But I, I always ask myself, why are the Chinese coming to Africa in such huge numbers? Why are these uh, Indians coming to Africa in huge numbers? Why are all these whites here? And I, I get to understand there's money, there's wealthy there are resources here in Africa. The opportunity is, or the, 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 the lack of um, opportunities that we have are not so much about money, but about two things mainly. Ignorance and um, the lack of uh, investment or capital in itself. I can tell you right now in Zambia, they've discovered the biggest copper reserve by uh, which 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 will be the biggest mine ever in the world, which one Bill Gates and um, <clears throat> Jeff Bezos want to invest in, which was just lying down here in Zambia. They are using super super technology, teach drones and all that to AI and all to to, to explore mine exploration within a flash of seconds. They're able to do that. Why? Because they're exposed. They've got a capacity. So I, I also feel that mm. is the route we should take. But if we all migrate and go to developed countries, of course, we'll make some good monies and all, then only a few of us will be able to develop. Or probably most, mostly a recolonization will occur. It will, it will happen. Today we are seeing our chiefs, they are selling land, our headmen, all our traditional leaders. So to me, I'm imagining everybody out there, especially people in the diaspora, it's a good thing to be out there, make your money, invest back in Africa, buy land. Land is not being made anymore. 
It's the only limited resources that we have. Then now, amongst the projects that I'm doing, I have my own consultants company that raises funds, does fundraising, both for NGOs and uh, startups, uh, especially for young startups. Under that, I've got different um, uh, projects that I'm working with, from farming, healthy, technology, and all. So if people want to reach out, they can always uh, reach out on, on Facebook, on YouTube, but there are all those things that I talk about. And I'm doing all that because I've had enough exposure and I've been able to access certain monies which I'm willing to share with those that have got brilliant ideas. And I'm open to people who want to invest in some of the things that I do. But my passion right now is food because food security is everything. You know, when somebody is hungry, they can do anything. That's so we need to sort out the issue of hunger and, and, and poverty. Then that's when we can focus at uh, other developmental issues that we have. Thanks a lot, my friend Tish. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. And thank you to our listeners and those who contributed to the conversation. Uh, the conversation will still be uh, here on Facebook and also uh, on YouTube. I will be posting it later so that uh, those who missed the conversation can keep on uh, watching and listening and see what you can learn. And um, I'm happy that Tish and Felix, you're going to be... Uh, connecting on the background and to talk about uh, projects that you can pursue together uh, and link up. You know, um, this is the beauty of uh, what this show is all about, is to make sure that we reach out to each other, collaborate and partner, um, you know, uh, with the rest of, of Africa and see what we can implement. And thank you so much uh, for your great thoughts and sharing your stories and the impact that you are bringing. And to everybody else, I think this is a goodbye for the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, bye. Let me end it here.